Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Peter Jacob. I'm the chief curator here at the Smithsonian's National Air and Space Museum. Welcome to The Yanks Are Coming, The Songs of World War I. This program is part of the Air and Space Museum's four-year observance of the 100th anniversary of the First World War. Our centerpiece effort for the World War I centenary is an exhibition in our Flight in the Arts Gallery on the second floor, just, uh, just across the way here, called Artists, Soldiers, Artistic Expression in the First World War. This exhibition, done in collaboration with the Smithsonian's Nest Museum of American History, features artwork produced by World War I soldiers. The exhibition includes more than 80 largely never-before-seen artworks and related artifacts that shed light on World War, I, World War I in a compelling and very human way. So I invite uh, all of you to uh, uh, take, that, take in that exhibition after the performance this afternoon. And for those of you uh, watching online, I uh, welcome you to uh, come visit the museum and see that exhibition yourself. Uh, the Artist Soldiers exhibition will be on view uh, through Veterans Day weekend this year, November 11th of this year, and will be the concluding uh, component of our World War I centenary observance. And now for this afternoon's concert. The Yanks are coming, the songs of World War I. We're honored to have with us Michael Lasser. Mr. Lasser is an author of several books on American song and social history, including American Songs, the stories behind the songs of Broadway, Hollywood, and Tin Pan Alley, Americans, America's Songs II, from the 1890s to the post-war years, and his newest book, City Songs and American Life, 1900 to 1950. He's a frequent lecturer on the topic, and since 1980 has hosted the nationally syndicated public radio show Fascinating Rhythm, for which he has won a Peabody Award in 1994. For more than three decades, he has spoken and performed at universities and museums around the country. We are very pleased to bring his unique perspective and presentation to the Smithsonian. Michael, thank you very much for being here today. Performing with Mr. Lasser today are Cindy Miller and Alan Jones. Ms. Miller performs a wide range of musical styles and has appeared in venues ranging from intimate clubs to large stadiums. She's received a master's degree from the Eastman School of Music and performs regularly with the Gap Mangione Big Band. She has appeared with the Benny Goodman Tribute Band, the Utica Symphony, Symphony Orchestra, the Rochester Philharmonic Orchestra, and the Central New York Jazz Ensemble. She has released several CDs of her own performances, including Love You Madly and I've Got the Music in Me. Alan Jones, singer and piano player extraordinaire, is best known as a cabaret performer. Like Ms. Jones, he too received a master's degree from the Eastman School of Music and is a noted performer, arranger, songwriter, and educator. He has been a guest artist with the Rochester Philharmonic Orchestra and, Brockport, and the Brockport Symphony, and he has released two recordings himself. So thank all of you for being here this afternoon. You're about to hear some wonderfully entertaining music. But we will also learn how much World War I changed America and how those profound social and cultural shifts that were reflected in the, were re reflected in the popular song of the time. World War I still resonates in our own time in a myriad of ways. One window onto this profoundly important time in American history is music. So let's now take a musical journey to a better understanding of how America was shaped by the world-changing events 100 years ago. Please join me in welcoming Michael Lasser, Cindy Miller, and Alan Jones. He's a funny little codger with a smile, his funny smile. Five feet none, he's an artful little dodger with his smile, his funny smile. Flush or broke, he'll have his little joke. He can't be suppressed. All the others fellows have to grin when he gets this off his chest. Pack up your troubles in your own kit bag and smile, smile, smile. Well, you've a Lucifer to light your fag. Smile, boys, that's the style. What's the use of worrying? It never was worthwhile. So pack up your troubles in your old kit bag and smile, smile, smile. Private perks. 
Fox went a marching into Flanders with a smile, his funny smile. He was loved by the privates and commanders for his smile, his funny smile. When a throng of Boches came along with a mighty swing, Perks yelled out, this little bunch is mine, put your heads down, boys, and sing. Pack up your troubles in your old kit bag and smile, smile, smile. While you've a Lucifer to light your bag, smile, boys, that's your style. What's the use of worrying? It never was worthwhile. So pack up your troubles in your old kit bag and smile, smile, smile. Thank you and good afternoon. It's good to be here. You can make the case that the 20th century begins not in 1900, but in 1914 with the murder of an obscure Archduke. The resulting war lasts just over four years and three months, even though we were in it for only the last year and a half. Even so, songs about the war were popular here from 1914 through 1919. Among the earliest were songs that came over from England, like the one you've just heard. During those years, American songwriters were not writing a lot of uplifting patriotic anthems, the sort of thing you might predict. They wrote what they knew. These were the songwriters of Tin Pan Alley, uh, the, the home of music publishing, in New York, and in those years, popular music was centered in New York City, and the songwriters, many of them, were under contract to the publishers. So if the publisher said, we want a certain kind of song, the songwriters went home and wrote it. They saw their work as a combination craft and business. It was not anywhere near as personal as many songs are today. The songwriters didn't write about themselves. They wrote what the market would bear. Um, they wrote what they knew. They wrote what they knew how to do. Uh, bouncy songs, ragtime songs, marches with lyrics that sounded like ordinary American talk. And that was a, a departure in the early 20th century. Song lyrics got conversational. They sounded like people talking rather than declaiming or, or rating, got much less formal. The emotions in the song, uh, as typical in popular music, were sentimental and idealized, but they still reflected what was going on in the world around them. Our first reaction to the war was isolationism. We wanted no part of it. It was their business, their problem. But over the next several years, you can see attitudes changing. And one of the ways you can watch the attitudes change is watch the sentiments expressed in popular songs. It was not clear from the very beginning which side we would take. There were lots of recent German immigrants to the United States. Um, we had a, a difficult relationship over the years with England. England was not the close ally. Remember, um, I hear they burned the White House. Um, so the, the, the relationship with, and we fought a revolution to get free of them. So there was a, a, a complicated and often negative relationship. The English took the Confederate side in the Civil War. So things were, things were not automatic between us and them. But we did eventually side with them. And what iced it was the sinking of the Lusitania in 1915 off the coast of Ireland. Here's a song to reflect the isolationist attitudes followed by the most popular of many popular songs about the sinking of the Lusitania. Ten mil 
million soldiers to the war have gone who may never return again. Ten million mothers' hearts must break for the ones who died in vain. Had bowed down in sorrow in her A nation is sad as can be. A message came over the sea. A thousand or more who sailed from our shore have gone to eternity. The Statue of Liberty High must now have a tear in her eye. I think it's a shame someone is to blame, and all we can do is just sigh. Some of us lost a true sweetheart. Some of us lost a dear dad. Some lost their mothers, sisters and brothers. Some lost the best friend they've had. It's time they were stopping this warfare. If women and children must drown. Many brave hearts went to sleep in the deep when the Lusitania
The next song we're going to do for you is perhaps the best known song to come out of the war um, and is, I think, uh, I think it's fair to say, is the, the greatest of our martial anthems. Um, compare it to uh, the song that Cindy sang a minute or two ago, uh, I Didn't Raise My Boy to Be a Soldier, from 1915, and on the other side of the Lusitania, and then this song on this side of the sinking of the Lusitania, and you get a sense of how American attitudes have changed. Uh, the writer of the song was a, a very famous and very popular man of the theater named George M. Cohan. Uh, he was a composer, a lyricist, a playwright, an actor, a director, a producer, and he owned the theater too. He was a complete man of the theater. He was, um, he, he thought of himself as an American, an Irishman, and a New Yorker. Not necessarily in that order, it depended on the moment. And when Congress declared war in April of 1917, he immediately left his office, went home. He had an office in his house. He went into the office at home, closed the door behind him, and went to work. He stayed there all night working on a song. He came out the next morning and rearranged the furniture in the living room um, the sofas and chairs, so that they were all facing in the same direction. That is, he turned his living room into a small theater. He was also, by this point, a very affluent man, so he could set up a fairly good-sized theater in his living room. He went, got, called his family, called his wife and his kids to come and sit in the living room. He went into the kitchen. He got a broomstick and a big tin pot and he put the tin pot on his head as if it was a helmet. And he stood in front of them singing the song as he marched back and forth. So his family was the first to hear what he called the dramatization of a bugle call. Get your gun, get your gun, get your gun. Take it on the run, on the run, on the run. Hear them calling you and me, every son of liberty. Hurry right away, no delay, go today. Make your daddy glad to have had such a lad. Tell your sweetheart not to pine, to be proud her boy's in line. Over there, over there, send the word, send the word over there. Send the word, send the word to beware. We'll be over, we're coming over, and we won't come back till it's over, over there. Johnny, get your gun, get your gun, get your gun. Johnny, show the hun, you're a son of a gun. Hoist the flag and let her fly. Yankee doodle, do or die. Pack your little kit, show your grit, do your bit. Yankees to the ranks from the towns and the tanks. Make your mother proud of you and the old red, white, and blue. Over there, over there. Send the word, send the word over there. That the Yanks are coming, the Yanks are coming, the drums from tumming everywhere. So prepare, say a prayer. Send the word, send the word 
to beware. We'll be over, we're coming over, and we won't come back till it's over, over there. World War I was our first European war. We had no idea what we were getting into. We actually thought that we'd go over there, teach the Hun a quick lesson, and come home. It obviously didn't work out quite that way. At first, once we got into the war, we had cocky songs about America's fighting spirit, or we had innocent songs that treated military life and even warfare like a kind of joke. Irving Berlin had written a song called Alexander's Ragtime Band in 1911. Um, it was extraordinarily popular. At a time when songs, I remember sales in those years were mainly sheet music. At a time when songs almost never sold a million copies. It was very rare. I mean, today, unless you go platinum, everybody yawns and goes back to sleep. I understand. It was not that way then. He'd written the song that was so popular, it sold a million copies in 1911 and another million copies in 1912. And because it was so popular, songwriters did what they always have done. They stole. And so suddenly, there were all sorts of Alexander songs on the market. Uh, it was, to this day, one of the most popular songs ever written. By 1917, 1918, everybody still remembered it. And so soon after we entered the war, songwriters gave us yet another Alexander song. And we'll follow it with a song that reflects America's healthy irreverence about military life. The 
other day I chanced to meet a soldier friend of mine. He'd been in camp for several weeks and he was looking fine. His muscles had developed and his cheeks were rosy red. I asked him how he liked the life and this is what he said. Oh, how I hate to get up in the morning. Oh, how I'd love to remain in bed. For the hardest blow of all is to hear the bugler call. You've got to get up, you've got to get up, you've got to get up this morning. Someday I'm going to murder the bugler. Someday you're going to find him dead. I'll amputate his reveille and step upon it heavily and spend the rest of my life in bed. A bugler in the army is the luckiest of men. He wakes the boys at five and then goes back to bed again. He doesn't have to blow again until the afternoon. If everything goes well with me, I'll be a bugler soon. Oh, how I hate to get up in the morning. Oh, how I'd love to remain at bed. For the hardest blow of all is to hear the bugler call. You've got to get up, you've got to get up, you've got to get up this morning. Oh boy, the minute the battle is over Oh boy, the minute the bow is dead I'll put my uniform away and move to Philadelphia And spend the rest of my life in bed No matter what songs are out there at any given moment, during a war, among the most memorable are the love songs. But the songs of World War I, the love songs of World War I, are not like the love songs of World War II. Uh, some of you may remember, or at least have heard some of those songs. I'll walk alone, uh, I don't want to walk without you. Um, but the, the spirit of the songs is different, even though the themes are the same. The songs are about parting and separation and longing and loneliness and the hope of return. Remember that when you said goodbye, you weren't talking about next Tuesday. You might have been talking about forever. And so the songs of World War II had a, a depth of emotion to them. But the songs of World War I did not. They were telling stories as much as they were focusing on characters' feelings. And they were much more overtly optimistic, much less nuanced, much less ambiguous. They're often jaunty and humorous and optimistic. These songs about parting and return from World War I make the point. a soldier brave and bold. Katie was a maid with hair of gold. Like an act of fate, Kate was standing at the gate, watching all the boys on dress parade. Jimmy with the girls was just a gawk, stuttered every time he tried to talk. Still that night at eight, he was there at Katie's gate, stuttering to her his lovesick cry. C -c -c Katie, beautiful Katie, you're the only c -c -c girl that I adore. When the moon, moon, moon shines over the cow shed, I'll be waiting at the k -k -k kitchen door. Jimmy thought when the wedding ring he bought. Now he's off to France, the foe to meet. Jimmy thought he'd like 
like to take a chance See if he could make the Kaiser dance Stepping to a tune all about the silvery moon This is what they hear in a far-off France c c c katie beautiful Katie You're the only c c, -c girl that I adore When the moon, moon, moon shines over the cow shed I'll be waiting at the kitchen door In a big advance, little Johnny stood the test. Johnny held his ground, now he struts around with a medal on his chest. There's a happy look in his eyes, and every now and then he cries. I'm gonna pin my medal on the girl I left behind. She deserves it more than I For the way she said goodbye You should have seen her Try to keep away the tears that blind A braver hero Would be hard to find She puts a smile in every letter that she Rides. And I can read be the heart between the lines. And when I get back, and when I get back, I'm gonna pin my medal on the girl I left behind. I've got to go, I must fight for Uncle Sam. Standing in the crowd, Mary called aloud, Fare thee well, my loving man. All the girls said, ain't he nice and tall? Mary answered, yes, and that's not all. If he can fight like he can love. Oh, what a soldier boy he'll be if he's just half as good in a trench as he was in the park on a bench. Then every Han had better run and find a great big linden tree. I know he'll be a hero over there He can love, why then it's good night, Germany. Every single day, all the papers say Mary's bow is oh so brave with his little gun chasing every hunt. Taught them to behave. Little Mary proudly shakes her head and says, Do you remember what I said? If he can fight like
like he can love Oh, what a soldier boy he'll be If he's just half as good in a trench As he was in the park on a bench Then every Han had better run And find a great big linden tree I never saw him in a real good scrap But you're a goner when you're in his lap And if he fights like he can love Why then it's good night, Germany Compared to this next song, that was a very minor, if amusing, song. This is perhaps the most important American love song to come out of World War I, and it has an interesting backstory. Jerome Remick ran one of the major music publishing companies in New York, Jerome A. Remick, Inc. But he started the company in Detroit, and when he moved to New York, he kept the Detroit office open. And working for him in Detroit, were a couple of young songwriters, a, a composer named Richard A. Whiting, who went on to have a, a, an important career in early talkies uh, before dying rather young, died in his mid-40s. Uh, he was also the father of the singer Margaret Whiting. And his, uh, his collaborator, his lyricist, was a man named Raymond Egan, not as well known, but both certainly very professional songwriters. And the, there was a, a big movie theater in Detroit announced that they were going to sponsor a contest for a best song. They would then uh, underwrite its publication and help to promote it. And so Mr. Remick turned to Whiting and, and Egan and said, okay guys, write a song. And so they went at it and they worked through the day and well into the night and at about 2 or 2.30 in the morning, they figured they had it. And they said they were going home and going to sleep. They were pretty well shot. So off they went. And they slept in the next morning. Fair enough. Egan left first. And before Whiting left, he thought to himself, I think I'm going to play it through. I want to hear it one more time. And he put it on the, the, um, on the piano and he played it. It was rather a pretty little waltz. And he thought to himself that it really wasn't enough of a melody to carry the kind of emotions that warfare calls up. And so he thought, well, we'll try again tomorrow. And he crumpled up the piece of paper and threw it in the wastebasket. And off he went to get some sleep. And the next morning, uh, Mr. Remick's musical secretary, a lot of these companies, like a lot of the songwriters who weren't very good at notation, hired musical secretaries who would write out the music that, say, Irving Berlin would hum. And sh there was this musical secretary on the staff, and she noticed this crumpled up piece of music paper in the, in the wastebasket. And she was curious, so she pulled it out, because she knew the guys had been there late. And she pulled it out, and she sat down at the piano and started to play it. And she thought, this was terrific. So she took it into Remick. And she played it for him, and he said, I love it. Let's publish it, but let's not tell the boys. It will surprise them. Oh, by the way, what's the title? And she said, Auf Wiedersehen. Well, in 1918 America, with the anti-German feeling and the, the less than enlightened view of civil liberties held by President Wilson, um, he was anti-black, anti-Semitic, anti-immigrant. He was, had the whole trifecta. He, th he thought that hyphenated Americans, you understand, hyphenated Americans, poisoned America. That was his word. Um, so they couldn't do that. And so Remick said to the secretary, 
what does Auwiedersehen mean? Her translation is the title of the song, Till We Meet Again. Some people may think that the war ended on Tuesday and the Roaring Twenties started on Wednesday. It wasn't quite like that. The flapper really comes into her ascendancy in the second half of the decade. Um, but there are times of great unrest in the years right after the war. You know, wartime, when, when the whole country is galvanized by war, as we were during the two world wars, things can turn very conservative. You want to hold on. You're fighting to preserve. You're fighting to hold on to, to affirm, to reaffirm. And so it's not surprising that the attitudes of the time are fairly conservative. Um, but after the, but it's also true that in the years after the war, you get unrest. All the soldiers come home and they need jobs. And what about the women who were in those jobs? Well, they're supposed to go back into the kitchen and that can chafe people. Um, you find it after World War I, you find it again after World War II. Um, you get 
strikes because people haven't gotten raises during the war. You get labor unrest. After, the world, after World War I, you get um, uh, the rise of the Wobblies, the IWW. You get um, strikes that become violent because the bosses hire cops in uniform to break up strikes and the strikers fight back. The strikers now are not the old line unions. It's not the AFL, which organized skilled workers. It's now the CIO, CIA, the CIA, CIO, sorry, yeah, I got it right the first time. That's a strange one. Uh, <laughs> Um, which is organizing industrial workers, uh, factory workers, and many of them are immigrants. You get the coming of prohibition. You get the Palmer raids against left-wing activists. It's a time of, of upheaval, and then you get the social upheaval as well with great changes in um, sexual behavior during the 20s as women make certain claims on the culture. As early as 1919, it was becoming clear that class barriers were beginning to change. By the way, one thing I should have mentioned that didn't is you get the coming of the Harlem Renaissance in the, in the 1920s as African Americans make a concerted effort to win the place they thought they had earned in the trenches during World War I, but the lynchings after the war gave the, the lie to that. Um, but these, these class barriers are beginning to ease. In 1919, the most popular musical on Broadway was a show called Irene. Its heroine was an Irish working girl who marries a Fifth Avenue millionaire. Class barriers are breaking down in something as broadly popular as a Broadway musical. In this particular story, and it is a Cinderella story, a working girl, even an Irish working girl, could marry all the way up. She was a good girl. She married the man she loved. But early in the show, she has a song whose melody feels like a 19th century sentimental ballad, but whose lyric suggests the change is in the air. It's a song that has one foot back and one foot forward. It's both traditional and up to date. The woman in the song, she's singing about herself. The young woman in the song is demure and proper, but she's also flirtatious and self-aware. The song, Alice Blue Gown, swept the country and what's interesting about it, I think, is that on one hand, it reflects a world that had ceased to exist, and on the other hand, suggests a new world in the making. I once had a gown, it was almost new. Oh, the daintiest thing, it was sweet, Alice Blue. With little forget-me-nots placed here and there When I had it on, I walked on the air And it wore, and it wore, and it wore Till it went, and it wasn't no more In my sweet little Alice Blue gown When I first wandered down in the town I was both proud and shy As I felt every eye But in every shop window I'd primp passing by Then in manner of I'd frown and the world seemed to smile all around till it wilted I wore it I'll always adore it my sweet little Alice Blue Gown my sweet little 
<laughs> One more thing about Irene that I think is interesting. Um, the Irish working girl and the Park Avenue millionaire want to get married. Guess who opposes the marriage? His mother, predictably, right? Her mother, too. She's Roman Catholic, he's Protestant. She's Irish. Know your place. Know where you fit, know where you belong, and stay there. Don't move out of the neighborhood. But it's the, ch so the, two, the two mothers, the previous generation, are holding on to the past, and it's the kids who are refusing to and making, obviously, trouble for everyone else and finding happiness for themselves in the way of musicals. In that same year of 1919, as the Doughboys come home, songs begin to look at, even celebrate, the ways in which the world would change when they come home again. They'd seen a wider world. They'd learned new lessons in the trenches of France, in the flesh pots of Paris. They were not the same young men who had sailed off. And so here are two songs about coming home. The first um, has to do with the Doughboys led by General Pershing marching up Fifth Avenue uh, in that great symbolic parade. Um, and the second song portrays a farmer who sent his son off to war and realizes that his son won't be returning to the farm. Jimmy's mother went to see her son marching along on parade in his uniform and with his gun. What a lovely picture he made. She came home that evening filled up with delight. And to all the neighbors, she would yell with all her might. You see my little Jimmy marching with the soldiers up the avenue. But there was Jimmy just as stiff as starch, like his daddy on the 17th of March. Did you notice all the lovely ladies casting their eyes on him? Away he went to live in the tent over in France with his regiment. Were you there? And tell me, did you notice? They were all out of step but Jim. One night, little Jimmy's father stood buying the drinks for the crowd. You could see that he was feeling good. He was talking terribly loud. Twenty times he treated my, but he was dry. When his glass was empty, he would treat again and cry. Did you see my little Jimmy marching with the soldiers up the avenue? There was Jimmy just as stiff as starch, like his daddy on the 17th of March. Did you notice all the lovely ladies? Casting their eyes on him It made me glad to gaze at the lad Lord help the Kaiser if he's like his dad Were you there and tell me did you notice They were all out of step They were all out of step but Jim Mr. 
Reuben started winking and slowly rubbed his chin. He pulled his chair up close to mother and he asked her with a grin. How are you gonna keep them down on the farm after they've seen Harry? How are you gonna keep them away from Broadway jazz and around and bank in the town? How are you gonna keep them away from harm? That's a mystery. They'll never want to see a rake or plow. And who the deuce can parley voo a cow? How are you gonna keep them down in the farm after they've seen Paris? And farmers always stick to the hay. Reuben, I'm not faking, though you may think it strange. But wine and women play the mischief with a boy who's loose with change. How are you gonna keep them down on the farm? After they've seen Harry, how are you gonna keep them away from Broadway, jazzing around and painting the town? How are you gonna keep them away from harm? That's a mystery. Imagine Reuben when he meets his pa. He'll kiss his cheek and holler, ooh la la. How are you gonna keep them? After they seen Paris. In the aftermath of the war, in the aftermath of all the troubles at home, we really decided we didn't want to be bothered. I mean, we didn't take a vote. We demonstrated in our behavior, both public and private. And so we eventually found ourselves engaging in a party, a nationwide party, mainly in cities, but across the nation, that we assumed would live, would last forever. And it did, or at least until 1929, with the coming of the Depression. The, the figure at the heart of the Roaring Twenties, of the Jazz Age, is the flapper. Uh, she embraced pleasure for its own sake for the first time in American history. I mean, the Puritans were spinning in their graves. Um, but it was a kind, not, it was not only an embrace of frivolity and joy and delight, it was also a rejection of a world that had collapsed around her. One of the things that World War I destroys, and that's why it begins the 20th century, it destroys the assumptions that the 19th century lived by. It was an age of crumbling. It was an age of things falling apart. It was called the 20th century. Novels no longer had plot. Music no longer had eight notes to work from. All the assumptions, and of course, social behavior. Women were now free to be sexual beings. Uh, the Bohemians called it free love. And so it was a time of enormous change, and the flapper embraced it and led it, not because she organized just by the behavior of a million different young women. Um, with her passion for partying and bootleg hooch, anybody here does not know what bootleg hooch is? Do you all know what bootleg hooch is? No, okay. it's okay not to. 
That's why I'm up here. <laughs> Bootleg hooch was the illegal whiskey that you made during prohibition. And it was smuggled into the, it was called hooch. And it was smuggled into the country by men called bootleggers. And so what you drank, and God knows what it was made of, you, what you drank was bootleg hooch. And if you went up, into, up to Harlem when somebody was having a, a rent party, you found bottles of it floating in the bathtub. Uh, partying, bootleg hooch, and sex. She defied and changed the meaning of acceptable female behavior. In fact, she was the first em embodiment of modernity in everyday middle-class American behavior. These weren't the rich who could afford to do anything they wanted. These were ordinary middle-class American women. A dazzlingly feminine reaction against the horror of World War I. could have a great career, and you should. Only one thing stops you, dear, you're too good. If you want a future, darling, why don't you get a past? Cause that fatal moment's coming at last. We're all alone, no chaperone can get our number. The world's in slumber. Let's misbehave. There's something wild about you, child, that's so outrageous. Let's be outrageous. Let's misbehave. When Adam won Eve's hand, he wouldn't stand for teasing. He didn't care about those apples out of season. They say that spring means just one thing to little lovers. Not above birds, let's misbehave. It's getting late, and while I wait, my poor heart aches on. Why keep the brakes on? Let's misbehave. I think what your own poor demure would be attractive while we're still active. Let's misbehave. You know my heart is true, and you say you for me care somebody's sure to tell but what the hell do we care they, they say, say that bears, bears have love affairs and even camels we're merely mammals let's misbehave we're merely mammals let's misbehave <laughs> When you're near, passion just overcomes me. Something about you numbs me. Tell me, why do I feel so queer? Every time you appear, I get like this one more hug and kiss. Curb your emotion, don't go off your nut. I've got the notion I could love you, but don't get excited. Keep your undershirt on. Maybe I've got stuff you admire, sis. Maybe I'm hot stuff, so remember this. Don't get excited. Keep your undershirt on. I always let the girls kiss me if they like it. And they like it After I leave them their total wrecks Oh baby, I'm just full of sex Though you'll upset me That's a chance I take Go on and pet me But for heaven's sakes Don't get excited Keep your undershirt on I've a nature that's far from cold My love is so intensive 
it makes me apprehensive. I fear if it should get a hold, I couldn't be controlled. I'd do a few things I shouldn't do. Curb your emotion, don't go off your nut. I've got a notion, I could love you, but don't get excited, keep your undershirt on. I've no objection to a hug or two. I like affection, but I'm warning you, don't get excited, keep your undershirt on. I always let the boys kiss me if they like it, and they like it. I'm wise to all of the tricks they spring. My mother told me everything. Though you'll upset me, that's the chance I'll take. Go on and pet me, but for heaven's sake, don't shirt on. I always let the boys kiss me if they like it and they like it. After I leave them they're total wrecks. Oh baby you're just full of sex. Though, Though you'll upset, upset me that's the chance I'll take. Go on and pet me but for heaven's sake don't get excited. Keep your undershirt on. Curb your emotion and Keep your undershirt on. The, the songs, th those by the way, are what's called flapper songs. Uh, songs like Ain't She Sweet and Five Foot Two and these two. The, the characters in them, the female characters in them are flappers. Uh, the, the buoyancy, the great bubble of, of the weightless bubble of the 20s was not the whole story of the decade. Um, even though it was happy-go-lucky and frivolous, I mean, Gatsby's parties are our great symbol of the, of the 20s frivolity, even though he had a high purpose in sponsoring them to meet Daisy again. And that other side is important because running at the same time through the 20s on a, on a much quieter track is somehow the optimism, not gone, but tempered by the burden of memory, the burden of wartime melancholy that we may not talk about, we may not even think about, but is sometimes there. Uh, I'm assuming that the, the last song we do for you today is one that you don't know, and that's fine, that's even good. Uh, it's from 1918, right in the shadow of the war. It's by two Tin Pan Alley songwriters named George Mayer and Grant Clark, and the name of the song is In the Land of Beginning Again. Sometimes there's tears behind a sunny smile. Some hearts hold sorrow for a long, long while. If we could only forget, think how much further we'd get. And, and though our, our hearts are filled, filled with sadness, Let's find 
find a paradise where sorrow can't live. And work the teachings of forget and forgive in, in the land of beginning again, where broken dreams come true. Thank you very much. Thank you.